This is FRM Part 2, Book 4, Liquidity and Treasury Risk Measurement and Management, and the chapter on the U.S. dollar shortage in global banking and the international policy response. This is a relatively short chapter. It's one of those working papers from the Bank for International Settlements. And it's another well-written chapter. The good news for you guys is that there are just a handful of learning objectives. But before we get to them, I wanted to point something out to you. Notice that the title of this chapter is called The U.S. Dollar Shortage and not a U.S. dollar shortage. And so we're specifically talking about the shortage that occurred in the 2008 financial crisis. But I'm guessing that you know that there have been shortages uh, in the U.S. dollar, you know, throughout the last 50, 60 years. And of course, this has implications for lots of the material that we've been covering over the last couple of chapters. For example, the use of foreign exchange swaps, the use of uh, global capital markets to borrow, and a whole, host, a whole host of other consequences. So if we look at these learning objectives, we'll see what those consequences look like. And then we'll try to decide how the U.S. Fed intervened and see how successful it was. All right, so the first couple of slides are going to be on the causes of the U.S. dollar shortage, and that sounds to me like a really, really good exam question. Then we'll talk about maturity mismatch and currency mismatch, and this is going to go hand in hand with lots of conversations that we had in the past. And then we'll talk about central bank swap agreements. In fact, uh, the Fed uh, engaged in some pretty substantial uh, trading in the swap market as, as a response. So let's go ahead and look at that first learning objective. Uh, three or four causes here. These are really, really good questions. All right, so the first one, unstable short-term funding. So back in 2000 or so, European banks held large quantities of U.S. denominated assets. And, you know, that sentence is true when you, you know, you think about U.S. European banks. But I want to give you kind of a, a, a specific example here. Um, I had a couple of students who did some research on what happened in Iceland in the 2007 and 2008 financial crisis. And I want to just remind you a little bit about that. You know, you take a country like Iceland, which, you know, for thousands of years relied mostly on, the, you know, the fishing industry and the tourism industry. But somewhere around 2000, the government decided to privatize some of their uh, some of their some of their banks. And what happened was that in order to encourage or motivate the global financial community community to view these banks in a different light, they allowed them to pay huge amounts of interest rate. I think it was 15 percent. You know, so lots of money flowed into these banks. So they had to do something with it. Right. And so what do you think they did? They looked over to the United States and said, hey, those mortgage backed securities, they look like they're pretty safe. Triple A rating, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not it wasn't just European banks that held large quantities of U.S. dollar denominated assets. It was financial institutions throughout the world, in, in particular Iceland. In fact, uh, you know, I think if I remember correctly, that at one point, at one point, Iceland held five or six times the amount of the size of its economy in in these large quantities of U.S. dollar denominated assets. All right. So to cure this mismatch, of course, this is a hu huge mismatch. If these American banks are holding few foreign denominated assets, those European banks have to borrow U.S. dollars in the interbank interbank market. So, you know, think about this. You know, they're flooding they're flooding these uh, uh, interbank markets and the spot rate of exchanges, you know, with their foreign currency and then they're withdrawing withdrawing U.S. dollars. So what does that say? Cause of U.S. dollar shortage, unstable short term funding. Now, of course, let's fast forward to 2007 or so failure of Lehman Brothers. Um, I'm sure you guys remember this. You know, we talked about we talked about this concept at length. Lehman Brothers and the repurchase market. And so let me just give you just a quick example. Let's suppose you're a financial institution and I am, too. 
you have a treasury security, uh, but you don't have any cash, and so you need to borrow from me. So you say, hey, Jim, will you, will you lend me some cash today? I'll let you hold my treasury security for a night. And let's suppose that treasury is valued at, let's just say, 95. And so I'm scratching my head, and I look at you, and I say, well, what are you going to pay me tomorrow? And you say, how about if I pay you 96? And I say, well, you know what? I'm not so convinced that that you're going to have 96 tomorrow. And I don't know what you're going to do with my money. And in order for me to give up this, I'm going to I'm going to make you pay me 97 tomorrow. And you hold your breath and you look at me and you say to yourself, you're not going to say this to me, you say this to yourself. There's no way I can come up with 97 tomorrow. So you say to me, how about of instead of you lending me 95 today, how about if you only lend me 94 and then I'll pay you 96. So you see how, you know, that this is going to increase those repurchase uh those repo rates, but it's also going to increase, you know, the propensity for these repo haircuts. All right. And so when Lehman Brothers collapse, because sooner or later, if you come to me and say, you, you know, you want to do this, I'm going to say, look, I'll, how about if I pay you 88 and, and tomorrow you pay me 100? Well, you're going to say to me, well, there's no way I'm paying you 100. It's not worth 100. It's only worth 95 or 96. And so that liquidity dries up. So then the market shifts over to the foreign exchange market in those uh, in those FX swaps. And we talked about this in a in a previous slide deck. So in these in this swap market, there was a shortage of US dollars because there was, you know, this massive influx of those foreign currencies. So second cause of this US dollar shortage, failure of Lehman Brothers. But remember on an exam question, you know, this was mostly because the repo market kind of dried up and that forced us into another market. And so there were lots and lots of extra activities in that FX swap market. And then remember, we had to we had to add a basis, you know, to get uh, to get some equilibrium rate to trade in the FX market. How about a real simple reason here? Need to refinance dollar debt. So international business had issued dollar denominated debt. I mean, foreign countries and foreign businesses would love to come to the United States and issue their bonds in the stronger U.S. dollar. But a lot of times, you know, their transaction costs and there's all, all sorts of uh, concerns about trade and conditions and rules and regulations. So it's not always efficient. But in the 1990s, you know, remember, we had this ex gigantic expanding economy. And then in the early 2000s, you know, you know, we had a little bit of a different issue after 9-11. But still, these foreign, especially foreign institutions, <coughs> realized that they could issue uh, their debt in the United States and it would be cheaper. So you have these, let me go back here, you have this failure and you have these unstable short-term funding. Now this of course occurs in 2007, <coughs> but leading up to that, you've got lots and lots of these businesses who are going to make these payments on their debt in the stronger dollar. So it was going to take more currency, more foreign currency units to repay their US dollar denominated debt. So once again, that means that there's going to be an increase in the demand for dollars in those exchange markets. And how about one that I think is probably um, among the more interesting, this asset liability mismatch. All right, so what do we know? We invested in these foreign banks invested in U.S. dollar denominated securities. So when when you've got mortgage backed securities and you have real estate prices and you have other asset prices that are fall, falling, then you have the asset side of the balance sheet shrinking. But the liability side of the balance sheet is not shrinking. And in fact, there are lots of them with U.S. dollar liability. So in order to correct that mismatch, uh, these foreign banks, banks then invested and purchased lots and lots of U.S. dollars. So there was an increase in global demand for U.S. dollars. And then one final simple one, this, this holds true throughout time, flight to U.S. dollars as a safe haven currency. That makes a lot of sense. So if you think about this, let me go ahead and just quickly go back. Hopefully I, hopefully I didn't give you a vertigo when I did that. 
you know, identify the causes. So the learning objective is to identify the causes. And so a good exam question would be to uh, create a question stem in which there is some information about unstable short-term funding. And then the possible answers are A, B, C, D, and E. And those are five really, really good questions. All right, so we've got this uh, tremendous pressure on the U.S. dollar. And so what in the heck is uh, a central bank to do? So you have all these central banks throughout the world, but in particular in Europe. And then we have the Fed here in the United States. And so what's, what's going to happen? So the European central bank goal was to uh, channel U.S. dollars to banks inside of its jurisdiction. And the easiest way to do that is to set up some kind of temporary, do I want to call it temporary, but let's call it a temporary swap market with lots and lots of other people, but in particular with the, uh, with the other central banks. And so look at, the, look at that third circle point there. As the crisis got worse, the swap lines were set up with Bank of Canada, Bank of England, Bank of Japan, other kinds of central banks. And look at that total amount, $583 billion. Here's a picture of this. So you got the U.S. Federal Reserve in the middle, and we're going outward to all of these other monetary authorities. And we're entering into these, you know, temporary swap arrangements. Notice down the bottom left, there's that Central Bank of Iceland. And then here's uh, some graphs that are taken right out of the chapter. Look at the, uh, the amounts going up on the vertical axis. Those are billions of U.S. dollars. The Euro system, Bank of England, and the Swiss, Na Swiss National Bank. And so, you, you know, you can see the spike occurring somewhere around, you know, 2008. And then after these swap agreements were... Uh, instituted in all these swap lines here. Let me go back here. All these swap lines uh, between U.S. Federal Reserve and all these other central banks. You can see the, the downward slope. Look at that first uh, arrow point. The Federal Reserve effectively engaged in international lending of last resort. I mean, you think about, it, you know, the Fed was uh, founded, oh, you know, 100 years ago or so. And, you know, what was its, its primary goal? You know, manage the money supply inside of the United States. But then it, it was considered to be the lender of last resort for financial institutions inside of the United States. And then when you have this global crisis, it makes sense then that the Federal Reserve would step outside of the geographic boundaries to become an international lender of last resort. Thank heavens the Fed is big enough and powerful enough and smart enough to be able to do this. Because if you look down on the bottom here, it says these swap lines help avoid two problems. Um, essentially, what it did is it created an unlimited amount of U.S. dollars. And so all these financial institutions had this demand. And the demand was the result of those five reasons at the beginning of the slide deck. And there's always a concern if you have lots of demand, is there going to be a supply to match? And the Fed was able to do that. And then the second part of this is that the Fed was the counterparty, and so it insulated the Federal Reserve from counterparty risk because of all of those different systems. Here, let me go back here. You've got all of these different monetary uh, authorities and monetary systems supporting uh, the swap lines. How about that learning objective on the maturity and the currency mismatch? All right, so we probably know this. Let me read quickly here. Disconnect between short-term assets and long-term liabilities on the balance sheet, of course. Disconnect between assets and liabilities in a given currency. So, so think about a financial institution that has a maturity mismatch. That's why we do that duration, duration matching stuff. But then a currency mismatch with, you know, let's say eight or 10 different currencies out there. So the currency mismatch has the potential to be much grander than the maturity mismatch. And look at that third arrow point. Of course, these mismatches are going to have 
uh, an impact on the company's liquidity. And so how do these arise? And we've talked about this in a previous slide. You can borrow in the domestic currency, you can borrow in the foreign currency, or you can use uh, an FX swap in order to uh, in order to provide the foreign currency units in the swap market or in the foreign exchange market and then take out dollars in that market. Now, what are some consequences here? Can lead to currency risk. Of course, that makes per perfect sense. It can lead to funding risk. You know, remember when a bank has a problem in rolling over its maturing liabilities, we call that a funding gap. And so when that occurs, this the financial institution is going to be impelled to sell those foreign currency assets, uh, probably at a haircut, maybe at a substantial loss. Now, most modern banks, of course, operate internationally. And so these banks in particular are exposed to foreign currency funding risk, which means they've got to continuously monitor not only their domestic balance sheets, but also the consolidated balance sheets. To give you a perspective, look, you know, the bank's total foreign claims grew from, you know, about 10 trillion. That's a T uh, in 2000 to, oh my gosh, over three times that amount by the end of 2007. So imagine this expansion of the financial institution's balance sheet. And it's not going to be just in the domestic currency. Go back to my example of Iceland. You've got this these Icelandic banks who, who all of a sudden they are holding, you know, tons of U.S. dollar denominated mortgage backed securities and all sorts of other kinds of derivatives and near derivatives. And that takes us through this relatively short chapter. So my my I think the focus is on that very first learning objective. Those are the most interesting questions that I think that can be asked, but also, also the relationship between that maturity mismatch and the currency mismatch. In particular, how does a currency mismatch then add to the risk of a maturity mismatch?